Enter, rejoice, and log in. One more time. Enter, rejoice, and log in. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and log in. We are the new trees and we're going to light the cat. Okay, here we go. Ready, Alice? Here we go. We light this flame as a symbol of new life, enlightening our way, as a symbol of the warmth in every human heart. Let the lighting of this flame be kindled in us, the inner light of hope, of peace, of love. May we share that light with all people. Good morning. I am Marie Luna, your Director of Congregational Life. Thank you for joining us today. It is good to be together. If you are joining us from another Unitarian Universalist congregation, welcome. If this is your first time visiting the fellowship, I want to extend you a special welcome. I hope that you will reach out to me to get more connected to the fellowship. You will find that we have a lot going on. One way to learn more is to join me for a special newcomer breakout at the end of the service. More information on that later. Today's service is being led and supported by Leah Thibodeau, our lay worship leader, Kim Hartman, our director of religious education, Steve Seek, our music director, our wonderful musicians and singers, Adam Robinson, our AV tech, and our guest speaker this morning is the Reverend Ty Alford. Ty has been a member of the fellowship since 1998. In 2016, he was ordained as a Soto Zen priest in training by Sosen Flynn at Clouds and Water Zen Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Last fall, he spent three months in residency at the Zen Mountain Monastery in upstate New York. When not traveling for training or playing music, he lives in Appleton with his husband, Tom Pinnenberg. Thank you to everyone who has made this morning's service possible. It is now time to settle in. Take a deep breath. Become aware of your body. Allow yourself to come into this space where we were all gathered together from our own. Hello, I am Marty Wheeler. And I'm Doug Wheeler. And here are two of the many reasons why we have been and continue to be a part of the fellowship. It is both a good theological fit for my belief structure, and it is a community of good people that I enjoy being part of. Over the years, the fellowship, through both giving and receiving, has nurtured myself and my family in many ways. The fellowship gives me hope for our future. While we may not always get it right, we do continue to learn and grow, showing people can work together to support one another and to help make our world better. Hey! 
Good morning, everyone. Today, our Time for All Ages story is called One Bright Pearl, and it's a Buddhist story of awakening from the Shobo Genzo, which is a big collection of writings by Ehi Dogen, who is the founder of Soto Zen. He lived from 1200 to 1253. Oh, Ty, excuse me. I'm sorry to interrupt. It looks like you're meditating. I am. You know, I'm trying to be like this really cool monk I just read about. His name was Shuansha. He was such a strong monk. He had a very strong practice. And he used to be a fisherman before he went to the mountain monastery to train as a Zen Buddhist. Wait, hey, wait, Ty, didn't you go to a Zen mountain monastery not that long ago? I did. I went there for three months. Xuan Sha had been at the mountain monastery for nine years. I can only imagine, you know, people think that being at a monastery is all peaceful and quiet. And it is, there's a certain element of that, but there's an awful lot of work. There's the cooking and the cleaning and the upkeep and all of it, the garden. And then in the middle of all that, you got to be studying Buddhist teachings and meditating. Oh my gosh, that sounds like a lot. Okay, now back to the story. It was a he was a monk and he had been a fisherman. And wait a minute, I think I might know this one. Is this the one where he gets sick of being at the monastery and then he thinks maybe he should go study somewhere else? Yes, it's called One Bright Pearl. Yeah, yep. And he was planning on leaving and he even packed his bags. And he was walking out, and a funny thing happened. He stubbed his toe and he stubbed it really hard and it was bleeding. I bet it wasn't that funny when it happened. Probably not. You know, you know, in cartoons when someone bonks their head and then they get this great idea. Well, this story, it was his toe instead of his head, but it gave him a good idea. It did give him a good idea. Xuan Sha realized that he didn't need to go any place. He didn't have to go any place at all to get what he needed. He realized that everything he needed was right there where he was and that he was not separate from anything. Buddhists say that we are already awakened and that there is no separate self. Yeah, you know, that kind of reminds me of the UU principle of the interconnected web of life. It's, it's like remembering that we are all part of the world and all part of the universe and everything we do affects everyone else. It does. You know, this moment of awakening was so big for Xuan Sha that he went on to succeed his teacher, Shui Feng. And this is how from generation to generation, this teaching was transmitted. It was it goes like this. Everything in the 10 directions or everything everywhere is one bright pearl. If you take a really good look at a pearl, it reflects everything in all directions all around it. Maybe you can't see it as easily, maybe as you could in a diamond or a mirror, but thinking of it in this way, it helps us understand how we are like pearls. We are always reflecting all that is around us and we are interconnected to everyone and everything. And just like a pearl, we are very precious. Oh, Ty, that's beautiful. Thank you. You know, you helped me to think about how I fit into the web of life and that I really don't need to go anywhere to learn about how to live well because. I'm connected to everything, so all that I need is right where I am. Thank you. Thank you.
is what should be done. By one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace, let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another, or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness. One should sustain this recollection, this is said to be the sublime abiding, by not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world.
I have this kind of frustrated fascination with the way people respond to someone else's bad news. It first struck me about 19 years ago. I was pregnant and things were not going well. It was during the early stages of the 23 weeks of bed rest I would experience that calls would come in and visitors would stop by. Everyone was so positive and upbeat, and all that made me feel was mad. I was scared, and I was angry that this was happening to me, and I just wanted that to be acknowledged. The positivity actually felt dismissive. It made me feel alone, and it put a tremendous amount of pressure on me. Like, if things didn't work out, it's probably because I just wasn't positive enough. It was so much pressure. I wondered why no one was able to just sit and be mad and scared with me. Fast forward now to the days of Facebook, and social media lays bare this hyper-positive response to people's bad news. You've got this, and you're so strong. Take up the space that I'm hoping might be used for some good old-fashioned empathy. Empathy is the ability to feel the emotions that are or may be present, especially in a time of suffering. But empathy can be tough. We're given plenty of suggestion that expressing our feelings is a sign of weakness. But empathy, the ability to feel all the feelings, is an important step in expressing compassion. I've been a bit of a student of compassion and life coaching over the last four years. That practice revealed to me a recipe of sorts for compassion. I would suggest that you need four ingredients to make compassion. First, awareness. We must be aware that there is suffering present. Second, inquiry. We need to check our thoughts about the suffering that we just became aware of. Third, empathy. We must allow ourselves to feel what it would be like to experience that suffering. And finally, action. We must do something to alleviate the suffering, or at the very least, to be sure that we are not adding to it. All four of these are necessary for the full expression of compassion. I suggest that if you're missing any of these ingredients, you might still make something tasty, but you haven't actually made a true compassion pie. So if we feel that we must skip the empathy for the sake of not appearing weak, then we can't quite move through the process of compassion to truly alleviate our suffering. When I was in a dark, uncertain, and scary time, I wanted to be allowed to feel and express the full range of emotions that came with the situation. I wanted to hear something that might have sounded like this. Oh, gosh, Leah, my heart is hurting. I am sad that you have to go through this. Please know that you are held, supported, and loved no matter what happens. You've got a great support network, and I too am here for you. I am a safe place for you to acknowledge all that this means to you throughout this journey. But for now, would Tuesday or Thursday be better for me to drop off a meal? Something like that is what I really wanted to hear. What I wanted was to acknowledge that this is scary. I just wanted to look at it, not dwell on it, but acknowledge it. Can we look in the painful places? 
I see now that the ability to do that is in fact necessary for the full expression of compassion for ourselves and for others. Suffering and the End of Suffering Healing Trauma with the Help of the Buddha Speaking of suffering, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the historical land of the Menominee, Winnebago, and Dakota peoples. I would like to dedicate the merit of this talk to ending the suffering of all beings, especially to the suffering of black and brown people. I dedicate myself to help end the violence of racism and embrace the humanity of my black and brown siblings. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Pride. May we all walk in confidence and beauty, hand in hand, realizing true freedom and happiness. The Buddha taught, as you're probably familiar, about suffering and the end of suffering, the reality of impermanence, and that there is no separate self. I have seen so clearly the reality of impermanence in the last year and how interconnected we are with everyone, everywhere. Usually, I think that I somehow walk around in life in a little bit of a daze, thinking things will just keep on like they've been keeping on, ignoring the reality of sickness, old age, and death. That's how the pandemic in the last year has just knocked that over. My hope here today is that I'd like to share with you some ways that I've been able to get some traction in creating less suffering for myself, to offer you some stories and tools that might be meaningful. So the kid's story was not really a kid's story, but one bright pearl. How can everything be one bright pearl? Maybe in this way. If you look at really closely at a pearl, it shimmers, it kind of reflects everything in all directions around it. Not so much as a mirror or a diamond. But if I think of it this way, it helps me understand how I am like a pearl. I am always reflecting all that is around me and I am interconnected with everyone and everything. Shuan Cha stubbed his toe, and woke up to reality. Almost everyone I've ever met that's gone on a spiritual journey did not start out because everything was going super great in their life. They didn't say, oh, I think it'd be so fun to sit and stare at the floor for hours sitting on a meditation cushion. Suffering brought me to Buddhism. In 2012, I was diagnosed with cancer, and I thought, I might die. And I thought, I don't want to die a jerk. And I think if I stay on the way I'm going, I will. So I started meditating in the Zen tradition. Now I had already been meditating since 1983, but I still struggled with my anger and grief. I was still using these outdated survival strategies that got me through my early life, but they were not working so well. We do all suffer. Some of us suffer early, some of us suffer late, but eventually everyone realizes the impermanence of life and the unfulfilling nature of more stuff. I wanna add here, that I, as a white person in the United States, have had amazing privilege that I didn't earn. And I have not had to deal with the oppression of systemic racism. So after realizing that I wasn't the person I wanted to be and knowing on a deep, deep level that I would not live forever, I applied myself to sitting meditation or zazen. Za means sitting, zen means meditation. I found a teacher, it took me a while. I had to go all the way to Minnesota 
at Clouds and Waters Inn Center. But a teacher I did find. I went to silent retreats or sessions where they are very specific about the way you do things, the way you eat, the way you walk, when you bow. And I had to be quiet. I took Jukai, which is taking formal Buddhist vows. And then I was fortunate enough to be able to take home leaving ordination in the Soto Zen tradition. So I had this image of what it was like to be a Buddhist monk, very intensely sitting still in one position, never moving no matter what. To be fair, there's a Buddhist teacher called Nagarjuna. He lived in the first century and he said that we should practice as if our hair were on fire. Wow. So why do all this? I guess I felt really motivated to change. There's a whole discourse that I could give about how I'm not my own favorite self-improvement project. I'll save that for another time. I found that the more that I can embrace myself just as I am, the more I really can act in loving ways to everyone in my life. I found that by going deeply into these Buddhist practices, it's given me a way to embrace who I really am with great love and tenderness and to heal some of the old patterns and wounds from my past. The things that were not very skillful. The funny thing is that the way that I've gotten there is through being more tender, not tough. So even though sometimes I do sit for hours in meditation retreats in silence, and I have learned a lot of Buddhist rituals and chants, what works the best is when I can extend compassion to myself right where I am. So I wanna share a meditation practice with you that I learned at the Zen Mountain Monastery when I was there last fall in upstate New York. It's called the Four Immeasurables. And we chanted it every morning at the end of morning zazen. It goes like this. May all beings be free from suffering and the root of suffering. May all beings know happiness and the root of happiness. May all beings live in sympathetic joy, rejoicing in the happiness of others. May all beings live in equanimity, free from passion, aggression, and delusion. I want to share it with you because it was super helpful for me during my first week-long session or silent retreat, I was having a lot of trouble sitting on my cushion. Part of what happens when I sit still in meditation, that whatever it is that I've been avoiding comes up. And it gets my attention. So I found doing this meditation, repeating this meditation to myself internally was really helpful. So I'd like us to do it together. To begin, go ahead and sit comfortably. Maybe rearrange yourself so that you can sit maybe either cross-legged on a cushion on the floor or maybe on a chair with your feet on the floor. Just sit in such a way that you feel grounded and that your hips are slightly above your knees if you can. Take a couple of deep breaths in and exhale a little more fully than you normally would. You can bring your attention to your heart center if you like. You might imagine a feeling of warmth or maybe a brightness there. And then you can, if you like, bring to mind just a small difficulty to start with. And then 
you can extend this meditation to yourself. And may I be free from suffering and the root of suffering. May I know happiness and the root of happiness. May I live in sympathetic joy, rejoicing in the happiness of others. May I live in equanimity, free from passion, aggression, and delusion. May I be free from suffering and the root of suffering. May I know happiness and the root of happiness. May I live in sympathetic joy, rejoicing in the happiness of others. May I live in equanimity, free from passion, aggression, and delusion. May I be free from suffering and the root of suffering. May I know happiness and the root of happiness. May I live in sympathetic joy, rejoicing in the happiness of others. May I live in equanimity, free from passion, aggression, and delusion. Brene Brown is well known for her research on vulnerability, shame, and courage. She says that the natural result of trauma is this propensity to armor up so that we don't have to feel vulnerable. The ironic thing is that actually being vulnerable is what leads to things, things I think I want the most, like intimacy, trust, belonging. I believe that beginning with myself, if I can extend this compassion to myself, then I can know the truth of what's really going on with me and extend loving compassion to myself. I get to heal the trauma. I found that as I'm able to extend this compassion to myself, that it becomes easier to do that with others. I'll tell you another story of how this helped me. So I've been at the monastery for about a month and a half, and it's a pretty rigorous schedule. You get up about 4.35, go to the Zendo about half an hour later, <clears throat> meditate for a couple of sessions of 35 minutes walking in between, go down to breakfast, Either you're working all day or you're meditating all day. There's really very little free time. So I've been doing this rigorous schedule for about a month and a half. And I, and then something happened and I got angry. Now, what was the remarkable thing to me of that is not that I got angry because angry is kind of my go-to, but that it had gone a whole month and a half with not getting angry at all. It wasn't like I was suppressing it and trying to not be there. It was just, I wasn't angry. Nothing came up. And I thought, wow, like what happened? How did I do that? And I realized that part of how I did that was that I didn't have an opinion about how anything should, the way anything should be. So <laughs> what to do now? So the first thing I did was I just, I felt the anger. I felt the intensity of that burning sensation. And then I began applying the four immeasurables. I just said it to myself over and over again, first extending it to myself because I realized how miserable I was. And then I would, in my mind, I would extend it out to the other person with whom I was angry. And I just kept doing that over and over again, kind of wherever I was. I would have moments of silence, but I just did it as much as I could because I was pretty miserable. So after a day or two, I noticed that that intensity of the anger lessened and I was actually able to address the situation with the person with whom I was angry. So I was able to do it. I was able to transform a situation. I was able to see the root of my suffering and then like apply the medication of the Buddha and it helped which I think is so awesome. So this is a meditation that you can do on your feet. You can do it on your cushion. You can do it on your feet. It's one that you can help gain some perspective on a situation. No matter what, it's never a bad idea to wish relief from suffering for myself and others. 
So coming back to this idea of healing trauma with the help of the Buddha. There are tools that I've gained in my training that have helped me navigate a way that I can feel good about. I've shared one of them with you today. It's kind of embarrassing that it's taken me 63 years to feel like I'm growing up, but better late than never. Being able to sit in meditation, to find ways to both calm myself and look deeply at the root of my suffering has made a difference in my life. I would recommend it. I hope that you get to hug your demons, embrace the parts of yourselves that you're not so crazy about. Look at yourself tenderly and know how lovable and worthy of love you are. Even though we live in a world of impermanence, there is so much beauty and love right here, right now. May we all be free from suffering and the root of suffering. May we all know happiness and the root of happiness. May we live in sympathetic joy, rejoicing in the happiness of others. May we live in equanimity, free from passion, aggression, and delusion. So at the end of um, talks at the Zen Center, we do a thing we call it dedicating the merit. And then we recite the Bodhisattva vows. I'd like to do that now. May our intention equally penetrate every being and place with the true merit of Buddha's way. Beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it. Reach out my hand to touch you beyond space and time. Reach out my hand to show you more than all the words. Reach out to hold you in my heart again. Love that holds.
from our ancestors This is the time we lift up the joys and concerns of our gathered community. It is our practice and commitment to always think expansively about who is included in our embrace. And during virtual times, our reach is even wider, stretching across space and time in new ways. As we seek to know and care about our big circle, let us first settle into our own lives, whatever might be triumphant or tender within ourselves and our inner circles. May you become companion to yourself. If you would like to share whatever is on your mind and in your heart right now, whether it is your life news or a request to be held in intention or prayer, you can type your joy and concern into the chat box. If you'd like to be included in our weekly care email, you can email anyone on staff or fill out our website form. We'll drop a link into the chat now. After the service, a member of the care team will host a breakout room for anyone who might like to share more about their joy or concern, or simply be in conversation about how life is going these days. Care and connection are available during the week too. Please contact our office if you'd like a listening presence or some help accessing resources and a minister or care team member will be in touch. As we give deep attention to ourselves, may it ripple out so that we can be present with each other. May this practice renew us again and again so that we might be able to offer and receive support and connection. May this silence help make it so. And we believe in life, and in the strength of love, and we have found a need to be together. We have our hearts to give, we have our thoughts to receive, and we believe that sharing is an answer. What does it mean to make an offering? Back when we gathered in the building, and we will again, the offering involved passing the basket, allowing people to put in whatever they could afford that week. It had a real, tangible feeling. And then our ushers would come to the front as we sang, from you I receive, to you I give. Together we share, and from this we live. It's still true. We give and receive as we are able, and this community allows us a chance to do that in so many ways, in our words, 
our actions, our commitments, and our financial resources. We know that there are always those among us who are in need, and we are here to help. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Reverend Christina or Reverend Leah if you are in need of financial or emotional support so we can offer help. And if you are one who is feeling stable and able to give, we ask that you do so so that our ministries might be able to continue for the months and years to come. As we come to the end of our service, we will extinguish our chalice flame, even as we still hold its light in our hearts. As, as we, we extinguish, extinguish this flame, flame let, us let us go our ways with hope in our hearts, hearts with our spirits renewed, and with a deeper understanding of life's, life's mystery. mystery. Let, let us carry the light of compassion and commitment to build a better world. After these closing words, we will have small breakout groups for conversation. In a moment, there will be a short postlude song. If you do not wish to stay for the breakout groups, I ask you to leave the meeting at that point. If you choose to stay, and I hope that you will, you will be invited to choose your own breakout group. One option will be for newcomers to join me to learn more about the fellowship and Unitarian Universalism. One option will be to join someone from our care team if you would like to share more personally and deeply about whatever is on your heart. One group will be led by Ty and will talk about compassion and healing. And one final group will be for informal, unmoderated chit chat. If you have any trouble selecting your room, just stay here and we will help you. And with that, go in peace knowing we embrace each other, even now from a distance.